Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Ted Burton. I'm Vice President of Communications here at Central Health. Welcome to our community conversation about our health care equity plan today. We really do appreciate those of you who are here with us in person and those that are watching via Facebook Live. This is our second community conversation in a series of three about the health care equity plan. Last Thursday night, we held a community conversation at Navarro High School, uh, and that one was specific to our patient population, the people that we serve here in the community conducted in English and Spanish. Today's community conversation is for our partners primarily. This community conversation is in English only. If you're joining us online via Facebook Live, we invite you to ask questions via the chat, and I will collect the questions from one of my, from one of my colleagues and ask the questions for our panelists. So thank you for being here again, and as we get started, I'd like to introduce the Board Chair of Central Health, Dr. Charles Bell. Thank you, Ted. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here this morning. Uh, I know that uh, we are in very, what I call flexible times, uh, where we have to adjust to our environment. And so thank you for being here in person, but also I'd like to thank the people that come on and those who are taking the time out to be able to uh, be with you today. Today we plan to outline our health care equity plan and give you an update on how Central Health is addressing the gaps identified in this crisis. I've served on the board now for five years and it has been both a learning experience I'll just provide some by the numbers uh, from our FY 2021 annual report in the healthcare equity plan. And there are several different panelists that are going to cover some very specific components of the healthcare equity plan. And then at the end of this meeting, we will take your questions. Uh, if we don't get to all the questions via Facebook Live, you are going to capture those. We will answer all of the questions and then we will post those so everybody will get the, the same answers. Okay. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can stay involved um, and continue to be part of this ongoing uh, planning process. So the next slide, please. So a quick overview. As I mentioned, Central Health is the Travis County Hospital District. In FY 2021, we provided access to care for about 147,000 people in Travis County, Travis County residents with low income. That was a 6% year-over-year increase from the previous year. We have a network of provider locations throughout Travis County, 204 provider locations. This includes health centers for primary care, hospitals, specialists, dentists, and urgent care locations. Um, in 2021, we provided more than 500,000 primary care visits through our network of providers, uh, and our provider network actually grew. Um, so 16 new provider locations that includes behavioral health, dental, and urgent care clinics. And you're gonna hear more about this as part of our long range uh, plan for the future. With that, we're going to uh, begin uh, our presentation. I'd like to reintroduce Monica Crowley, my colleague, Senior Counsel, Chief Strategy Officer. Monica. <laughs> Trying to figure out the logistics of this. Uh, thank you. 
Um, if you follow uh, Central Health's work, you might remember seeing last summer around this time of year going into the, the budget season, community conversations talking about a proposed priority for the Central Health Board for fiscal year 2022 around service delivery. And in February of this year, the board adopted a service delivery strategic plan, which we are referring to now as our healthcare equity plan. Um, that was uh, the work that we did was funded in large part by a grant from a nonprofit foundation. And that was work I think about that some of you might have participated in with the community, community engagement work that uh, Yvonne is going to talk about in a minute. And this plan represents a plan that will guide the healthcare service delivery work for Central Health for the next seven to ten years. And it is work that is going to allow us to develop a comprehensive, culturally affirming high quality, affordable system of health care in Travis County that will improve the health of the communities that we serve. And the next slide shows the approach that we took. Um, we started with the voice of the community work. So the main foundation for the health care equity plan was um, talking to the communities that we serve in Central Health uh, looking at, at after we gathered uh, data and assess data about the health needs and disparities from uh, the communities that we serve. Um, we started with, uh, and when we say for the community that we serve, just so that everyone knows, uh, we're starting with the voices of residents of Travis County who have incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level. And this year, for a family of four, that's about $55,000 annually for that family of four. And I really like the way that um, our CEO, Mike Mason, has put it in the past when he talks about this foundational work and that we really looked at the lived experience of the people that we were serving to obtain uh, insights into culturally affirming care and needs that serve as uh, the, the kind of bedrock for this plan. Uh, the plan also included two other foundational assessments. It included uh, the first safety net community health needs assessment that really is taking a lens and focusing on the needs of the populations with income IOs, 200% of the federal poverty level and not uh, populations that were served by a hospital system or you know the county and city overall was the whole population um, and we also did a capabilities and gap needs assessment of really looking at where and how services are provided and how many services are uh, available to be provided to um, if this low income population that is served by central uh, health. And then we uh, combined those assessments, and that's what, uh, what was uh, fed into developing the goals and imperatives and measures and priorities uh, that are the healthcare equity plan. And now we're all going to take a little bit more time to look at each of these uh, different things. Thank you, Monica. Yes, so Central Health believes that the community um, needs to be at the center of addressing healthcare disparities and healthcare needs. And so last fall, we worked with a third party vendor, uh, a third party vendor to launch the voice of the community as part of the work that Monica was talking to us about. And, uh, we did so by engaging with uh, communities, we engaged with families and community members, and we gathered their feedback uh, via a combination of focus groups, one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews,
put a breakdown in terms of demographics of the people that we put, that we gather feedback from, that we engage with, that we talk to, and uh, these who have experience navigating and receiving care throughout the safety net healthcare system. Uh, participants also included uh, people from low-income communities and also people experiencing homelessness and also advocates from uh, for people who are hard to reach, such as uh, formerly incarcerated individuals. And so this slide really shows the, the responses by gender, by age, by race and ethnicity, and then also by member, not member status, so medical access program member status, because we wanted to make sure that we were talking to, to our MAP members. So 100, we talked to 186 MAP members. Our uh, community outreach um, staff members actually picked up the phone and called people and had conversations with people because that's um, how much important they were hearing from directly from MAP members is. Uh, we did one-on-one one -on -one interviews with 29 people experiencing homelessness, uh, thanks to uh, collaboration with Sun Sunrise Church. Uh, we also talked to 15 community organizations, including um, community groups uh, advocating for our patients. And we also talked, met with 10 institutions in the health, transportation, and education field uh, that also serve our patients. And so after taking a deep dive into the communities um, here in Chavez County, we really did learn a lot of valuable insights into the culturally affirming care and needs to people's uh, lived experience. And so we, we heard so much from 320 people, but um, these were some of the high overarching trends and takeaways, um, four main takeaways. One is that uh, med the medical access program is indeed making a difference in the in the life of our members. Uh, and uh, so, any anybody that we talk to who, who is who is a member of the, of the math program um, was thankful, grateful, and they, they really appreciated the, the services that they were receiving. Um, and then number two, members want and need additional education about the benefits and other resources. Uh, it was. Um, uh, I would mean for me in particular to hear some of our members uh, say that they didn't understand that they had access to, for example, the mental health services. And so uh, that was very, very eye opening for me. Uh, and so we're, we're already doing some work around um, math member education. And so, number three, language access barriers hinder accessing and navigating their, the healthcare system. A key um, thing to note here is that. Uh, what we heard was that once people get to the doctor, they were okay with the language access line, um, but it was in, it was the navigation um, to get to the doctor that was really really difficult and challenging for individuals, particularly for individuals who are uh, who are older and um, and perhaps don't have access to technology. But uh, language was a, was a key uh, was a key issue. And then the fourth. Thing. The fourth takeaway was the wait time for appointments and, and patient provider communication uh, is a very whole critical issue. So we will we'll dive into um, you know wait times uh, for appointments here in a bit. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Yvonne. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, and I'm going to provide a little bit more information about the safety net focus community health needs assessment portion of um, our healthcare equity plan development. And I think we've done uh, two slides on this. Uh, the two slides are uh, a very, very brief example of the type of information that is included in the 144 page needs assessment that really looks at access and disparities and, and different needs across 14 different uh, regions all across Travis County. Uh, so this is just a little bit of a sample of some of the highest level information that we have in that needs assessment. Uh, it is on the Central Health website, and I, I think it's uh, interesting, and, and it's worth actually looking into because it looks at the different, uh, some of the different factors that you want to mention. Uh, by geographic region in a lot more detail than we're going to be able to um, get to uh, today. And just in case people are wondering, Central Health does continue to participate in the community-wide 
Community Health Needs Assessment and Child at SHIP, which is the Community Health Needs Assessment and Community Health Improvement Program that's uh, run by Austin Public Health and that I trust Health and Human Services participates in, but this really is just looking at the needs of the population at the federal poverty level, which is different in uh, Austin if we're looking at that specific population and uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that we discovered in looking at data specifically about populations under children just on the federal poverty level are that while there is widespread poverty across Travis County, um, the greatest density of people living in poverty still remains uh, on both sides of the I-35 corridor. If you've got a pit two miles on either side of the I-35 and along I-35, it's where we see 74% of Travis County residents with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level uh, resigning. And so although we do see increases in other parts of the county, uh, like people living under the incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level, this increase in suburban poverty does not equate to a decrease uh, of urban poverty along this I-35 um, corridor. Uh, and one of the things that we really noted is uh, if you look in this area kind of on both sides of the I-35 corridor in the Runford St. John's neighborhood, uh, that contains about 17% of all of the families living in poverty in Travis County, uh, just in that one uh, This also, this slide goes into a little bit more detail and the um, kind of the, the signification of the different colors isn't based on density of many things. It's just it shows the different uh, three kind of key regional areas we looked at, uh, and, and it lets you uh, kind of see which of those three areas we were we addressed in addition to looking at needs in 14 uh, areas in the county. We also look at three larger regions. There's the central region along the I-35 corridor and east and uh, west Travis County. And one of the things that's demonstrated in this slide is the number of additional people that live in each of these focus areas who are potentially eligible for programs like that. And uh, if you look along the I-35 corridor, uh, there's opportunity for us to enroll more people in every one of the areas. In this area along the I-35 corridor, there are a little over 16,000 people that could be additionally enrolled in that. Many of them uh, do live in the number here, but there are also a lot of people in Fox uh, Boston in the Garrison Park area, and then kind of south uh, South East Austin and the Western area that uh, we can enroll additional people in. And then, in addition to um, opportunities for enroll people in the neighborhood, we also have additional opportunities in the neighborhood of the and a jungle in Western and Western Travis County. Now, Dr. Jones is going to come up with if I could slide, please. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, as we stated previously, we're a really young hospital district. And as many are aware, previous to about 2019, the method by which we have arranged the other is clearly contractual obligations. In 2019, as this legislature, uh, uh, allowed a committed uh, Travis County Hospital District to directly employ providers. And we'll share a little bit more about what that means and the work that we've been doing uh, a little bit later. But um, by, by being able to directly employ, employ providers, we can meet some of the needs that you see up in front of you. Um, I think we can all agree that throughout the care continuum, there are opportunities to improve care. 
Are there are moderate gaps. It means that we are losing about 70% of the community income. But there are significant gaps. It means that we are losing less than 50% of the community income. And again, we'll touch on uh, some of these areas uh, in just a little bit. Next slide, please. There's a provider shortage. Now, the provider shortage, shortage is critical, and it's across all specialties. Primary care is significant, as is specialty care. Um, the, the delineation that sits in front of you um, divides the shortage based on physicians uh, and then advanced practice providers, so nurse practitioner, practitioners, and physicians assistants sit on the other side. Um, as we continue to grow, we need to continue to grow um, additional providers throughout um, the hospital district. Now there are clinics that are going to be up and coming in uh, Eastern Crescent, um, in addition in uh, Post Dot 35, Thomas Ports, and there will be additional availability um, for care. In addition, we need to continue to extend hours, so early morning, evening, and weekend hours, and also consider other methodologies to provide care, so telehealth and telephonic um, access to care. Next slide, please. Um, so just getting to a little bit more information about the healthcare activity plan, this uh, slide summarizes our clinics of healthcare activity plan, but in the plan we just a lot more detail about uh, each of the variables, uh, and it includes um, measures, targets, and tactics that we're looking at addressing. Um, but really all of these strategic imperatives and priorities are in service of the main goal, which is to develop this comprehensive, equitable system of care that is also accountable. And but it's not just simple health care in the plan really involves optimizing the collective of our community-wide resources that are available to serve uh, this population within the federal poverty level. And the priority areas, our strategic imperative areas, include increasing access to capacity, increasing increasing care coordination, really focusing on community care, not just care outside uh, from the hospital back home or into uh, servicing the transition to different uh, areas of the healthcare system, really focusing on the number of enrollment and engagement and progressive language barriers, particularly uh, barriers in communities where women can contemplate languages uh, spoken in the household that Devon was mentioning earlier, and then also really working on building out the system of care. Access and capacity um, that we heard that we are working on uh, um, opening a specialty care clinic that is about 16, 17 months away. We're looking at moving to Rosa um, to serve as that expansion site. Six specialties are slated to uh, operate RZ, um, GI, pulmonology, podiatry, nephrology, neurology and cardiology we'll be working on that that site. In addition, we will provide on-site diagnostics. So the more we can kind of offer a one-stop shop to our, our patients and the folks in our communities who have challenges with transportation, um, the better it is um, for our communities. In addition, that's what we're doing as far as our direct practice in medicine. There are many contractual um, uh, available services through many of our enterprise partners and through other partners throughout the community for specialty. Right now, we are working with uh, the University of Texas as related to a master service agreement, in which will house multi, uh, multiple specialties, including ophthalmology. And that agreement right now is going back and forth between attorneys and should hopefully be in the next couple of weeks. And that will increase access um, to services. Um, as far as healthcare for the homeless, 
We are working again with enterprise partners and directly to increase our street familiar teams. And right now we're posting this for a psychiatrist. One of the opportunities we have, um, and one of the challenges that, that is often presented to everybody who's experiencing homelessness, is it's difficult to make an appointment and then those individuals have to follow up in two or three days, a week. Um, when individuals experiencing homelessness, homelessness need help, they need help right then and there. And so we are hiring a psychiatrist to operate with the street team so that when an individual needs help, they get help. Um, in addition, um, we all are aware of um, the addiction um, crisis um, and um, the opioid use crisis um, that exists with you guys down in Mexico throughout the, throughout the country. Um, we are we have a medical assisted therapy program um, in which we prescribe Suboxone. Um, we both have a program in the primary care environment and with um, the digital care so that we can better care to individuals who have uh, medical diagnoses and also addiction diagnoses, and also individuals who have more advanced mental health diagnoses and may not be that stable to where uh, the environment of physical care is more appropriate to go with health with their addiction disorder um, and with um, their mental health um, diagnosis. One of them mentioned transition to care. Any time our, our patients transition from one district environment to the other, to take over from the skilled nursing facility to the hospital, to the hospital skilled nursing facility, or hospital to rest. Um, because the system is so complicated, because there are different formula, because there are different electronic health records, because there may be challenges with transportation, any time there is a transition, patients will fall out of jail. So we have hired Dr. Hanali Patel, and they said, well, we have a director of transition to care. And her task, it's a big task, is to build care environments within all of the disparate care and uh, institutions so that we can hold our patients' hands as they move from one care environment to the next. We don't have to go to the building, it's not an electronic health record system, and so that work is being undertaken now. Um, education and research. Uh, it's also critically uh, important. Um, we are expanding uh, our, our education footprint. Um, if we think about disease as being a care continuum, I'll, I'll focus on renal disease as, as an example. Um, we are hopping and jumping away from setting up uh, dialysis access um, for, uh, for many of our patients who have unsafe renal disease. The reason that this is critical is Right now, the only access these patients have is the natural dialysis, which is a misnomer. Right? What that really means is when a patient gets really sick, they present to the emergency room, and a dialyzed emergency room um, at that point. This program will set up kind of a predictive um, access to dialysis, which will actively improve our patient's health. What we really wanted to do, though, well, that's the end of the continuum. What we really want to do is focusing on the other side thereby we screen individuals, um, which we really know. And if they happen to spill protein in their urine, it means that they may have some kidney damage. And with education and preventative services, we can hopefully avoid them from going from spilling protein and some kidney injury to an end-stage disease. Um, and so that is our attempt now. The more we can focus on upstream care for all of our patients, any of their care conditions, um, the better it is for the overall health and well-being of our population mm -hmm. and natural education that comes into play. And lastly, we've spoken about central health's um, ability now to be able to hire providers. Um, in order to practice mm -hmm. medicine, we have to set up policies and procedures. We have to we set up an executive board, credentialing, peer review, quality, um, pharmacy and therapeutics money, all of the things that help us actually manage medicine, um, but we're also rolling out the electronic system. So when building a healthcare infrastructure really from the ground up and that takes time, the, the positive to that is we have an amazing partner that any kind of strategic direction of our partners changes, the more our patients stay in the risk of falling out of care um, or being at risk. The more we can directly employ our providers and use their forms, the more we are, in fact, in charge of that care, and the better the patient care will be for our
So this is our last slide. Thank you all for bearing with the kind of details of the lengthy presentation. Uh, but what we spent the most time talking about today is this top uh, top wall, and that is our healthcare improvement plan. It is the seven to ten year service delivery strategic plan. That in my mind, I think about it. It's the what. What are we going to going to do, what do we need to do, what goals do we need to achieve? Um, we are about, well, we have started working on the next phases of the planning efforts, which include operational implementation plans that help us determine uh, what's the timing of which of the goals we're going to address, what's the sequencing, what's the location, what's the size, how big uh, does it need to be? And then also, how are we going to pay for it? So these next next parts of the planning efforts address how, when, and how we're going to pay for it. Then operational implementation, financial sustainability. This isn't kind of a one and done planning process because we have an annual process that includes central health and boards, budget development, which uh, in the central health budget and the budget resolution, which includes the annual priorities, that usually lays out uh, its a strategic policy document for central health that guides our work for the next one, two, three years. And uh, the work that Dr. Schalter just talked about is work that the board um, proposed during the fiscal year 22 strategic plan and then work that has been able uh, to begin planning efforts on as we're moving into the fiscal year 23 budget process. So if you think about it, it's kind of staggered timelines. There's the annualized process that sets out annual priorities for work for what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, uh, how we're going to pay for it. And then we're also beginning uh, eight to ten month process of this operational implementation of financial sustainability planning that will give us this longer term sequencing that we are going to aim for and how we are going to achieve this work and how we are going to pay for it. Last night, the board uh, approved the acceptance of an additional $600,000 for the President of the Health Care Foundation to help us uh, get the financial uh, and uh, analytics uh, help that we need and then also continue the planning help so that we can implement kind of benchmark and best practices for how we see this is work and also how we can do additional community engagement to make sure that as we're uh, actually developing the programs for how we're going to achieve the health care plan, that this voice of the community work is that there's constant, constant feedback so that we know that we're uh, addressing the needs um, that the folks can change in the community on a regular basis as Austin continues to change. Thank you, Monica. So speaking of continuous community engagement, uh, how do we stay in point involved? Um, so in the short term, so Monica was talking about also the long term, so we do, I, I had said earlier, and we do uh, see that the community needs to be at the center of addressing healthcare disparities and needs. And so in the short term, um, there will be, as I mentioned earlier, more community conversations. There's an additional community conversation happening at the Southeast Health Health Center next Thursday. So as you mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, the 9 to 9, 16, and 23 are about the healthcare equity plan. And then we're going to come back and, and do another series of community conversations from August 1st to the 19th, and that will be around our fiscal year 2023 budget, which is, is going to be based on all of this work that we've, been, that we've heard about. Um, also, subscribe for updates, and there's a link on the uh, on the screen as well, participate.cdl.net slash HPP, and click and subscribe. There's also a way to subscribe for updates via text, HP, by texting HTTP to the number on the screen. And as Monica mentioned earlier, this work around making sure that the community is at the table, it will be ongoing. So we're going to do that this again in the fall and then next year. So this is ongoing. Mike Eastman, our CEO, mentioned last Thursday evening our community conversation 
we can't do this alone. This really needs to be a, a joint planning effort and a joint care execution effort. So, um, so we will need y'all's help in staying on the involved as well. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Ken. Great. Thank you, everybody, for the presentation. We know that was a lot of information. So now is the chance for you to ask some questions. If there was something that perhaps um, didn't make sense or you would like clarity on or even more information on, we can do that now. So I'll start with people in the room to see if anybody has a question. And then we also have folks that are watching via Facebook Live and they can chat through messages. Okay. Do you have a question? Would you mind coming up here and using the mic so that people that are watching at home uh, can see? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. My question is, uh, I had tried to pick up, keep up with uh, Central Health quite a bit, but I've only been trying to understand in uh, many cases, when you're looking at the strategic planning, when you're looking for the future, how does community clear and do they acknowledge everything that you do? Are they autonomous? Does Central Health provide a, uh, a, a, a way of doing it and then Central Health implement it? Or can they reject it because they're autonomous? I've always wanted to get a clear understanding between community care and Central Health. Um, so that question is our model with Central. That's a great question. So thank you. And uh, um, it, uh, our model is community care. Is we are a public entity, federally uh, qualified health center model. So Central Health is the public, the you know taxing entity, bringing tea from HRSA of the uh, the FQHC grant, but because FQHCs are required to be governed by their own board, which is at least 51 percent made up of um, uh, patients of that federal qualified health center to make sure that you know underline all of the decision making, there is that patient voice built into it. They do have independent uh, decision making. Uh, they, they actually are required to have the HHSC grant. The day to day operations are uh, administered by the CEO of community care. But Central Health does participate through board appointments in employing. So it, it, is, it is a mix up. All of the employees of community care are also Central Health employees. We have uh, uh, an uh, administrative equipment and facilities arrangement with them where some of the facilities there are owned by Central Health and so uh, they have a very good deal on rent. So it's expensive. Uh, we share some services like our uh, technology and uh, the information system services, our HR services. Uh, and we share accounting and HR uh, policy with community care that uh, if they're going to di diverge, so sometimes you need to get a policy for a direct service provision of the city, like central health network and so now you just have a part policy uh, for how you deal with uh, deals and things like that. But community care there. And so they come to central health for people when their kind of HR and financial policies differ from central health policy, but the CEO of community care is in charge of the day to day operations of community care, and the governing board of community care is in charge of the oversight of that CEO. So, yeah. Sorry, can I? Can I just say that? Thank you. Sorry. I think that, that was a great question. Um, I couldn't really think of better than most people who were thinking that. I think this is a great opportunity that exists here. As we continue to build out the hospital district, there is a primary care system that is not only one of the largest in the country, but also one of the most complicated and the best in the country to care for our patients. And as the hospital district matures and you build out the transitions of care with the clinical environments that you can build, and with the use of epic of our electronic health record and it's a vertical system that we stand to build. So patients should fall out of care less 
and we're building it right away. We've got <coughs> primary care sites, and then we can build the areas of need. I, before I came to Texas, I was part of another system that started an FQHC, and they were a hospital system that was looking for an environment to care for patients that were just being discharged out of the hospital and had no landing spot. So now we actually have this amazing care environment for the primary care base, um, and we can build it size right to different care environments to care for people preventatively to get upstream on that care for people and stop people from keeping pushing mm -hmm. And we do spend a lot of time collaboratively uh, planning on uh, facility location, size of facilities, what services are going to be offered in the different uh, primary care facilities because it's not the uh, community care is a that's our largest uh, and one of the advantages, before I was going to be enough to sit, you know, on this side of the house, I sat with the community and the medical office. And so there is so much integration between the organizations. There's a lot of opportunity, right, that still exists. Benefits and other resources. Uh, it was um, uh, eye-opening for me, in particular, to hear some of our members uh, say that they didn't understand that they had access to, for example, a men mental health services. And so uh, that was very, very eye-opening to me. Um, and so we're we're already doing some work around um, map member education. And so number three, language access barriers hinder ac accessing and navigating their the healthcare system. A key um, thing to note here is that uh, what we heard was that once people get to the doctor, they were okay with the language access line, uh, but it was it, it was a navigation um, to get to the doctor that was really really difficult and challenging for individuals, particularly for individuals who are uh, who are older and um, and and perhaps don't have access to technology. But um, language was was a key uh, was a key issue. And then the fourth thing, the fourth takeaway was the wait time for appointments and, and patient provider communications uh, is uh, they're, they're both critical issues, and we'll we'll dive into um, you know wait times uh, for appointments here in a bit. Um, so I'll, I'll now turn it over to, I believe it's back to you. Yes, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, and I'm going to provide a little bit more information about the safety net focused community health needs assessment portion of um, our healthcare equity plan development. And I think we've got uh, two slides on this. Uh, the two slides are a, a very, very brief example of the type of information that is included in the 144 page needs assessment that really looks at access and disparities and, and different needs across 14 different uh, regions all across Travis County. Uh, so this is just a little bit of a sample of some of the highest level information that we have in that needs assessment. Uh, it is on the Central Health website and I, I think it's uh, interesting and, and it's worth actually looking into because it looks at the different uh, some of the different factors that Yvonne was mentioning uh, by geographic region in a lot more detail than we're going to be able to um, get to uh, today. And just in case people are wondering, Central Health does continue to participate in the community-wide a community health needs assessment, the CHA uh, CHIP, which is the Community Health Needs Assessment, Community Health Improvement Program that's uh, run by Austin Public Health and that uh, Travis County Health and Human Services participates in. But this really is just looking at the needs of the population under 200% of the federal poverty level, which it's different in uh, Austin if you're looking at that specific population than if you're looking at the health care needs of the whole community. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that we discovered in looking at data specifically about populations under 200% of the federal poverty level are that while there is widespread poverty across Travis County, um, the greatest density of people living in poverty still remains 
uh, on both sides of the I-35 corridor. If you've got um, if two miles on either side of I-35 and along I-35 is where we see 74% of Travis County residents with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level uh, residing. And so although we do see increases in other parts of the county uh, of people living uh, with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level, this increase in suburban poverty does not equate to a decrease uh, of urban poverty along this I-35 um, corridor. Uh, and one of the things that we really noted is uh, if you look in this area kind of on both sides of the I-35 corridor in the Runberg St. John's neighborhood, uh, that contains about 17 percent of all of the families living in poverty in Travis County, uh, just in that one uh, neighborhood area. Next slide, please. This also, this slide goes into a little bit more detail and the um, kind of the, the signification of the different colors isn't based on density of need or anything. It's just, it shows the different uh, three kind of key regional areas we looked at uh, and, it, and it lets you uh, kind of see which of those three areas we were, we had addressed in addition to looking at needs in 14 uh, areas in the county. We also looked at three larger regions. There's the central region along the I-35 corridor and east and uh, west Travis County. And one of the things that's demonstrated in this slide is the number of additional people that live in each of these focus areas who are potentially eligible for programs like MAP. And uh, if you look along the I-35 corridor, uh, there's opportunity for us to enroll more people in every one of the areas. In this area along the I-35 corridor, there are a little over 69,000 people that could be additionally enrolled in MAP. Many of them uh, do live in the Runberg area, but there are also a lot of people in uh, far south Austin in the Garrison Park area and then kind of south, uh, South southeast Austin in the Dove Springs area that uh, we can enroll additional people in. And then in addition to um, opportunities to enroll people in neighborhoods like the uh, Colony Park neighborhood, we also have additional opportunity in areas around the Wyatt Oak Hill and uh, Jonestown in western, western Travis, Travis County. Um, and now Dr. Shalsha is going to provide information about the capabilities and gap assessment. All right, next slide, please. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, as we stated previously, we're, uh, we're a young hospital district. And as many are aware, previous to about 2019, the, the method by which we have arranged care is through contractual obligations. In 2019, the Texas legislature uh, allowed or permitted um, Travis County Hospital District to directly employ providers. And we'll share a little bit more about what that means and the work that we've been doing uh, a little bit later. But um, by, by being able to directly employ, employ providers, we can meet some of the needs that you see up in front of you. Um, I think we can all agree that throughout the care continuum, there are opportunities to improve care. Where there are moderate gaps, it means that we are meeting about 70% of the community need. Where there are significant gaps, it means that we are meeting less than 50% of the community need. And again, we'll touch on um, some of these areas uh, in just a little bit. Next slide, please. There's a provider shortage. Now the provider shortage, shortage is critical and it's across all specialties. Primary care is significant as is specialty care. Um, the, the delineation that sits in front of you um, divides the shortage based on physicians um, and then advanced practice providers, so nurse practitioner, practitioners and physician's assistants sit on the other side. Um, as we continue to grow, we need to continue to employ 
um, additional providers throughout um, the hospital district. Now there are clinics that are gonna be up and coming in uh, the Eastern Crescent. Um, in addition, in uh, close to I-35, Chalmers Courts, there will be additional availability um, for care. In addition, we need to continue to expand hours, so early morning, evening, and weekend hours, and also consider other methodologies to provide care, so telehealth and telephonic um, access to care. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just getting to a little bit more information about the health care equity plan, this uh, slide summarizes our 26th page health care equity plan that in the plan it goes into a lot more detail about uh, each of the imperatives uh, and it includes um, measures, targets, some tactics that we're looking at addressing. Um, but really all of these strategic imperatives and priorities are in service of the main goal which is to develop this comprehensive, equitable system of care that is also accountable and that it's not just central health doing this work alone. The plan really involves optimizing the collective use of our community-wide resources that are available to serve uh, this population with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level and the priority areas, our strategic imperative areas include increasing access and capacity. It includes increasing uh, care coordination, really focusing on transitions of care, not just care outside uh, from the hospital back home or into uh, skilled nursing, but transitions of care between different uh, areas of the healthcare system, really focusing on the member enrollment and engagement and addressing language barriers, particularly uh, barriers in communities where English and Spanish aren't the primary languages uh, spoken in the household that Yvonne was mentioning earlier, and then also really working on building out the system of care infrastructure that uh, Dr. Shalsha just mentioned. Next slide, please. We are working on, uh, on opening a specialty care clinic that is about 16, 17 months away. We're looking at Rosewood, Zaragoza um, to serve as that expansion site. Six specialties are slated to um, operate out of RZ, um, GI, pulmonology, podiatry, nephrology, neurology, and cardiology. You will be working out of that, that site. In addition, we will provide on-site diagnostics. So the more we can kind of offer a one-stop shop to our, our patients and the folks in our communities who have challenges with transportation, um, the better it is um, for our communities. In addition, that's what we're doing as far as our direct practice of medicine. There are many contractual um, uh, available services through many of our enterprise partners and through other partners throughout the communities for specialty. Right now, we are working with uh, the University of Texas as related to a master service agreement, um, which will house multi, uh, multiple specialties, including ophthalmology. And that agreement right now is going back and forth between attorneys and should hopefully be inked in the next couple weeks, and then we'll increase access um, to services. Um, as far as healthcare for the homeless, we are working again with enterprise partners and directly to increase our street and mobile teams. Um, right now we're posting for a psychiatrist. One of the opportunities we have um, and one of the challenges that, that is often presented to individuals experiencing homelessness is it's difficult if you make an appointment and then those individuals have to follow up in two to three days, a week. Um, when individuals experiencing homeless need, homelessness need help, they need help right then and there. And so we are hiring a psychiatrist to operate with the street team so that when an individual needs help, they get help. Um, in addition, um, we all are aware of um, the addiction um, crisis um, and, um, and the opioid use crisis um, that exists within Travis County and actually throughout the, the, throughout the country. 
Um, but we are, we have a medical assistive therapy program um, in which we prescribe Suboxone. Um, we both have a program within the primary care environment and with, um, with integral care so that we can better cater to individuals who have uh, medical diagnoses and also addiction diagnoses and also individuals who have more advanced mental health diagnoses and may not be that stable to where uh, the environment of integral care is more appropriate to both help with their addiction disorder um, and with um, their mental health um, diagnosis. Monica had mentioned transitions of care. Uh, anytime our, our patients transition from one disparate care environment to the other, if they go from skilled nursing facility to the hospital, if they go from hospital to skilled nursing facility or hospital to respite, um, because the system is so complicated, because there are different formularies, because there are different electronic health records, because there may be challenges with transportation, any time there is a transition, patients can fall out of care. So we have hired Dr. Hamali Patel within Central Health, who is our Director of Transitions of Care, and her task, and it's a big task, is to build care environments within all of the disparate care uh, institutions so that we can hold our patients' hands as they move from one care environment to the next. We don't have to build a building. It's not dependent on an electronic health record system, and so that work is, is being undertaken now. Um, education and research. Um, is also put, uh, critically important. Um, we are expanding uh, our uh, education footprint. Um, if we think about disease as being on a care continuum, and I'll, I'll focus on renal disease as, as an example, um, we are hop, skip, and the jump away from setting up uh, dialysis access um, for, uh, for many of our patients who have end-stage renal disease. The reason that this is critical is Right now, the only access these patients have is compassionate dialysis, which is a misnomer, right? What that really means is when a patient gets really sick, they present to the emergency room and are dialyzed emergently um, at that point. This program will set up kind of a predictive um, access to dialysis, which will actively improve our patient's health. What we really want to be doing, though, that's the end of the continuum. What we really want to be doing is focusing on the other side whereby we screen individuals, um, which we're doing now, and if they happen to spill protein in their urine, it means that they may have some kidney damage. And with education and preventative services, we can hopefully avoid them from going from spilling protein and some kidney injury to an end-stage disease. Um, and so that is our attempt now. The more we can focus on upstream care for all of our patients in any of their care continuums, um, the better it is for the overall health and well-being of our populations, and that's where education uh, comes into play. And lastly, we've spoken about Central Health's um, ability now to directly hire providers. Um, in order to practice medicine, we have to set up policies and procedures. We have to, we've set up a medical executive board, credentialing, peer review, quality, um, uh, pharmacy and therapeutics committees, all of the committees that help us actually manage medicine. Um, we're also rolling out electronic health record systems. So we're building a healthcare infrastructure really from the ground up and that takes time. The, the, the positive to that is we have amazing partners that anytime the strategic direction of our partners changes, the more our patients stand the risk of falling out of care um, or being at risk. The more we can directly employ our providers and move care forward, the more we are, in fact, in charge of that care, and the better the patient care will be for our providers. Next slide, please. So this is our last slide. Thank you all for bearing with the kind of detailed and lengthy presentation. Uh, but what we've spent the most time talking about today is this top uh, top ball, and that is our healthcare equity plan. It is the seven to 10 year service delivery strategic plan that in my mind, I think about it, it's the what. What are we gonna, going to do? What do we need to do? What goals do we need to achieve? Um, we are about, to, well, we have started working on the next phases of these planning efforts, which include operational implementation plans, 
that help us determine uh, what's the timing of which of the goals we're going to address, what's the sequencing, what's the location, what's the size, how big uh, does it need to be, and then also how are we going to pay for it. So these next, next parts of the planning efforts address how when and how we're gonna pay for it in operational implementation of financial sustainability. This isn't kind of a one and done planning process because we have an annual process that includes Central Health Board's budget development, which uh, in the Central Health budget and budget resolution, which includes the annual priorities, that usually lays out uh, it's a strategic policy document for central health that guides our work for the next one, two, three years. And um, the work that Dr. Shalsha just talked about is work that the board um, proposed during the fiscal year 22 strategic plan and then work that has been able uh, to begin planning efforts on as we're moving into the fiscal year 23 budget process, so if you think about it, it's kind of staggered timelines. There's the annualized process that sets out annual priorities for work, for what we're going to do, how we're gonna do it, uh, how we're gonna pay for it. And then we're also beginning a eight to 10 month process of this operational implementation and financial sustainability planning that will give us this longer term sequencing that we are going to aim for in how we are going to achieve this work and how we're going to pay for it. Last night, the board uh, approved the acceptance of an additional $600,000 grant from the Episcopal Healthcare Foundation that's going to help us uh, get the financial kind of an, uh, analytics uh, help that we need and also continuing planning help so that we can implement kind of benchmarks and best practices for how we sequence this work and also how we can do additional community engagement to make sure that as we're uh, actually developing the programs for how we're going to achieve the health care equity plan, that this voice of the community work is that there's constant, constant feedback so that we know that we're uh, addressing the needs um, that of course may change in the community on a year to year basis as, as Austin continues to change. Thank you, Monica. So speaking of continuous con uh, community engagement, um, how do we stay informed and involved? Um, so in the short term, so Monica was talking about also the long term, so we do, like as I said earlier, uh, we do um, see that the community needs to be at the center of addressing healthcare disparities and needs. And so in the short term, um, there will be, as Ted mentioned earlier, more community conversations. There's an additional community conversation happening at the Southeast Health and Wellness Center next Thursday. So as he mentioned earlier, as Ted mentioned earlier, 9th, June 9th, 16th, and 23rd are about the healthcare equity plan and then we're going to come back and, and do another series of community conversations from August 1st through the 19th, and that will be around our fiscal year 2023 budget, which is, ba is going to be based on all of this work that we've, been, that we've heard about. Um, also, subscribing for updates, and there's a link on the, uh, on the screen as well, participate.centralhealth.net slash HEP and clicking subscribe. There's also a way to subscribe for updates via text H -E -P, by texting HEP to the number on the screen. And as Monica mentioned earlier, this work around making sure that the community is at the table is will be ongoing. So we're gonna do that this again in the fall and then next year. And so this is ongoing. Mike Giesling, our CEO mentioned last Thursday evening at our community conversation, we can't do this alone. This really needs to be a, a joint planning effort and a joint a execution effort. So, um, w so we will need y'all's help in, in staying informed and involved as well. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Ted. Great, thank you everybody for the presentation. We know that was a lot of information. So now's the chance for you to ask some questions if there was something that perhaps uh, didn't make sense or you would like clarity on or even more information on, we can do that now. So I'll start with people in the room to see if anybody has a question. And then we also have folks that are watching via Facebook Live and they can chat their messages. 
Sam, do you have a question? Do you, would you mind coming up here and using the mic so that people that are watching at home uh, can see? Thank you. Thank you, Ted. My question is, uh, I have tried to keep up, keep up with uh, central health quite a bit, but I've always been trying to understand the communication. When you're looking at the strategic planning and you're looking for the future, how does community care handle it? Do they acknowledge everything that you do? Or are they autonomous? Does central health provide a, uh, a, a way of doing it and then central health implements it? Or can they reject it because they're autonomous? I've always wanted to get a clear understanding between community care and central health. Um, so that question is our model with central that's a great question so thank you and um, it uh, our model with community care is we are a public entity federally uh, qualified health center model so central health is the public the you know taxing entity grantee from HRSA of the uh, the FQHC grant, but because FQHCs are required to be governed by their own board, which is at least 51% made up of um, uh, patients of that federally qualified health center to make sure that, you know, underlying all of the decision making, there is that patient voice built into it, they do have independent uh, decision making. Uh, they, they actually are required to have the HHSC grant. The day-to-day -day operations are uh, administered by the CEO of community care. That central health does participate through board appointments in employing. So it, it, is, it is a mixed bag. All of the employees of community care are also central health employees. We have uh, uh, an uh, administrative equipment facilities arrangement with them where some of the facilities they're in are owned by central health and so uh, they have a very good deal on rent and expenses. Uh, we share some services like our uh, technology and um, yeah, information system services, our HR services, uh, and we share accounting and HR uh, policies with community care that uh, if they're going to di diverge, so sometimes you need different policies for a direct service provision entity, like Central Health never up until now needed to have a sharps policy uh, for how you deal with uh, needles and things like that, but community care did. And so they come to Central Health for approval when their kind of HR and financial policies differ from central health policy, but the CEO of community care is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of community care, and the governing board of community care is in charge of the oversight of that CEO. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry, can I? Can I just speak? Right, right here. If you stay here, you Oh, sorry. Um, the, uh, I think that, that was a great question. Um, and I couldn't have answered better than Monica, so thank you for taking that. I think this there's a great opportunity that exists here. As we continue to build out the hospital district, there is a primary care system that is not only one of the largest in the country, but also one of the most complicated and one of the best in the country to care for our patients. And as the hospital district matures, and we build out with transitions of care, with the clinical environments that we can build, and with the use of EPIC as our electronic health record and the integration of patient care, it's a vertical system that we stand to build so that patients should fall out of care less, and we're building it the right way. We've got a huge primary care base, and then we can build the areas of need. Um, I Before I came to Texas, I was part of another system that started an FQHC and they were a hospital system that was looking for an environment to care for patients that were just being discharged out of the hospital and had no landing spot. So now we actually have this amazing care environment that is primary care based um, and we can build appropriately and size right the different care environments to care for people preventatively and get upstream on that care continuum and stop people from even thinking about going to the hospital. 
And we do spend a lot of time collaboratively um, planning on uh, uh, a better co-applicant um, to, to work with in community care. And one of the advantages is before I was fortunate enough to sit, you know, on this side of the house, I sat within community care as their chief medical officer. And so there is so much integration between organizations. There's a lot of opportunity, right, that still exists for us to continue to move together um, in a unified direction. But there is a lot of integration between community care and central health. I'm gonna, that was a great question, and Sam is one of our uh, alumni of our Community Health Champions program, so he's been very involved in the local health care delivery uh, effort. And I think this is also an opportunity just to, to talk about the fact that we try to educate on the fact that we are part of the same enterprise. So Central Health, Community Care, and Sendero are nonprofit health care, um, health insurance company, basically. So we are all part of the same enterprise uh, as Monica, that explained it can be a little bit of a complex relationship. Mia, you had a question. Is African Americans use the emergency room as their primary care provider? Mm -hmm. So do you have a program or anything like that that maybe you can partner with the emergency rooms because that is a lot of African Americans primary care provider? Happy to, happy to, great question as well. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement uh, as related to African uh, American communities. Um, I think one of the programs that is um, about to be up and running, if it's not already up and running, running is maternal health for, um, for African American communities. And community care is um, uh, uh, about to start a, a doula program and partner with a community partner. Um, in order to meet the need because the, the disparities that we do see in maternal health um, that really do differ by demographic um, really have needed focus for a while. So that, that it's either running or it's about to be up and running. In addition, that Transitions of Care um, uh, initiative, and it's not a program, but the initiative and the bill that I spoke to um, will include um, focusing on people in the emergency room because many times people come into the emergency room to get a script renewed um, and don't go to their primary care provider. So we're actually looking to put care teams um, where we may be able to sign folks up for MAP if they qualify to renew scripts, to uh, book appointments in primary care, um, potentially um, to help with other um, social-based needs. And so that is in the, in the build phase. Great question. On the front end so they don't end up in the ER uh, which is more expensive and perhaps not even and it's, it's, it's good of outcomes. Can you elaborate on that? Happy to. I, I think that's, that's a great point. You know, the U.S., I think, spends more than any other country on care, um, and we spend all of our funding on endpoint care. So that care continues, we spend it on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. So our goal here, as we continue to build, we should be aiming to that front side, to screening, prevention, immunizations, um, you know, uh, decreasing food deserts, you know, improving access um, to internet and other resources that will really help, um, uh, you know, communities that are struggling really advance. So, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start with that because really the me measurable way to do that is to add more providers and so you know it's not it, and so it's not um, I'm going to say the disappointing thing about it is when you truly need to add more locations and more access and more providers there's no way to flip this on building out permanent locations that have additional kind of one-stop shop diagnostic specialties that have really long wait times. We are also contracting with um, current providers in the community to increase access in, in the shorter term today. I think for some of these um, truly uh, woefully under-resourced specialty areas, the only way we're really going to improve uh, wait times is by adding adding services, and so Dr. Shalsha, 
I, there's not much I can add to that. I'll just add some specificity. I think one objective method by which we look at um, access to specialty are wait lists and wait time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think continuing to track that is critically important. To Monica's point, we've just increased access to cardiology, just increased access to GI, um, the ophthalmology I spoke about, and other services which we are in the process um, of creating access with, with our Dell partners. Um, and, um, and that is as we prep for that you know, RZ and the build out of that specialty clinic. And we need to do both. We can't put all of our eggs in one, in one basket. Um, and as we build our internal infrastructure, whereby which allows us to cater to our patients' needs, um, we, we continue, I mean, we still need to partner with, with others, and we'll always need to partner with others. So as a follow-up, Dr. Schultz, you mentioned that um, part of this analysis was to identify where we are now in current state regarding if we have enough providers, primary uh, special care, but also a roadmap for the future in terms of can we meet demand in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Do you mind just touching on that again? The, the statistics that we see now tend to worsen over time, right? So the deficiency of providers we have now, when we look five years down the road, actually is going to increase unless we think creatively. We do look to um, including advanced practice providers and collaborative care team members. And by collaborative care team members, we're talking you know, pharmacists, dietitians, social workers. Um, pharmacists can actually carry a panel of patients independently. They can practice in a collaborative care agreement with providers and manage, for example, individuals who have a diagnosis of diabetes, who have a diagnosis of hypertension under a, a, a physician's kind of scope of practice and a delineated um, plan of care. Uh, we can conduct better care to patients. They can have many more touches within the healthcare system that is not dependent on them only being seen by a physician. And so that and looking at technology and creative methods to administer care or how we're gonna, we're gonna get to um, or avoid five years from now where we have this increased efficiency of providers. Great. More questions from the room? Anybody, Dr. Shai? Anybody have Dr. Moody? I know you're not sure. <laughs> thank you so thank you so much for your for your time. And once again I appreciate our partnership. The question I have is we talked about a, a shift in policy to actually provide to to move to a kind of a provider uh, model and we talked about the need for um, the acquisition or improvement of, of more providers. If we look at it from an equitable position is there a plan to ensure that the providers that we're trying to recruit and or uh, uh, acquire, um, uh, uh, we're doing that through an equity lens, especially when you look at, once again, people of color uh, would appreciate to have providers of color. Mm -hmm. Great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doctor, Many of you may know Dr. Jewel Mullen, and Dr. Jewel Mullen was the first hire for our medical executive board um, so that as we set up our practice of medicine, anything we develop, we develop through a lens of health equity. And so she was the first new hire to our medical executive board, sits within quality um, and the other medical executive committees. And so as we continue to progress, um, we do exactly that. Um, the more that our um, healthcare team um, understands the communities for whom we're responsible, the greater the chance um, for a successful outcome. And I think it's, it, it, it's at all levels, right? So we can look at physicians, and hopefully we, we are hiring physicians who represent our communities, all the way to community health workers, which is another initiative that we're working on as well, because if Monica and I had our way, Right, we'd have a community health worker for every 10 patients. So we, we are working on that, but great point. And uh, the Dell Medical School was, is, will be providing a report in July, and part of that report and part of their commitment is to train and graduate doctors who will stay in the community, and so there'll be more from the Dell Medical School uh, coming up in our July, our July board meeting. So thank you, Dr. Moody. Any other questions uh, from the audience? I have some more, but I'd better let you guys ask first. Anybody have any questions? Sam? 
Maybe I might just say up here. Just, uh, I was wondering, we're talking about the Dell Medical Center, are we using residents uh, that are there uh, to, to assist you guys in any kind of other, have them, have them go to different locations and provide their services? Because uh, my wife is a physician, she did that uh, at San Antonio and provided a lot of help in the community as part of her program. So so we are taking advantage of uh, residents and uh, third years or, or, or medical students? Okay, good. Uh, and I can give some specifics to that. Um, I think when we look, uh, when we look about six years ago, um, when the med school was just kicking off, um, I think there were a few different resident groups that worked within community, worked within community care, and none of the medical students, obviously at that point, when they start off in their first year, had access. Um, now, um, community care has affiliation agreements with the med schools specifically. All of the medical students rotate through, over 220 residents rotate through community care, when we are looking to set up our specialty clinic, um, we are working with the medical school so that fellows um, and other appropriate folks work within that environment because when you couple uh, clinical care with education, um, you end up in a really good spot. So, so we're I want to uh, circle back to Monica. Earlier in the presentation, you talked about the safety net, community needs, community health needs assessment. And I think one thing that was sort of an eye opener um, for us may have been um, the distribution of poverty in the, in the county. And you said something that I think you have to let it sink in for it to make sense, but I wanted you to, to perhaps just revisit this, which is that the suburbanization of poverty is not resulting in the de-urbanization of poverty. Mm -hmm. And now we know where the majority of people with low income, people that we could be serving in Travis County live. Do you mind mm -hmm. just revisiting that topic? Yes, and actually, I don't, I don't want to let an opportunity to go to waste. So JP and Sarita, do you want, guys mind maybe trading trading off with me and, and revisiting that a little bit, whichever one could. You guys come come up and maybe you tag off with, with Alan and I for a second. We have our uh, uh, demographics and data and analytics folks. This is how we put our colleagues on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to go a little bit more into the data because I think there, there were some, some, what was new information for us regarding the distribution of poverty in the community and not only where people live, but opportunities for us to get more people enrolled in the medical access program and into care. Um, and the slide is on the Sure. So um, I think I'll try to answer your question, Ted. So what we've seen, if you look on the... Uh, the map on the left is that um, poverty is dispersed throughout the county. Um, there's poverty in the urban core, there's poverty in these suburbs that are popping up. Um, however, um, if we are to look for where there is the most density, where that po population is really concentrated, um, we need to stay, we will primarily look up and down that I-35 corridor um, both to find where there are low-income residents and where there's the most opportunity to serve those residents. So um, while we obviously need to acknowledge these outer areas um, and find ways to serve those populations, um, we know from our own data, from uh, looking at our own patients and the population at large, there remains um, the greatest need, the greatest opportunity really up and down this main corridor going down I-35. And we never talk about serving one area and excluding another. We're no. looking at the areas as a whole, but we looked at 14 different study areas, correct? correct? That's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and as Monica mm -hmm. said, um, you know, the, we what we found was areas such as Runberg, such as Montopolis, Dove Springs, um, we still have significant need remaining in those areas. And um, maybe to even go further on this, I think um, one of the trends we're seeing um, and we're really looking into is, uh, you know, post-pandemic here, um, we've seen a lot of movement from our entire population, not just low income, um, into many of these suburban areas. I mean, I don't think I'm, everyone knows it. to where um, 
the in these areas beyond Travis County, um, areas in Williamson, Bastrop, and Hayes County, and um, how are we going to um, serve those populations when they are no longer Travis County residents, but they still need to come back here and get care? Good point. Questions from our audience? Anybody else? Please join us. This question is to the aspect of things of you guys, but what are y'all doing or do y'all have anything that's putting a microscope on the asthma or respiratory um, department when it comes to children based off the COVID-19 pandemic that we just are suffering through? And is dental uh, a thing with um, what you guys have to offer? I'm asking about uh, respiratory uh, illness and disease related to COVID-19 for kids and also dental services. Um, thank you. <laughs> no, nobody join me up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a great question. Um, first of all, I think it's exciting that there are now two vaccines that are available for COVID for, for under the age of five. So I think we need to celebrate that. Um, the uh, One of the specialties that I'm not sure I stated was pulmonary within, um, within that new specialty clinic. So that is one of the additional specialties um, and respiratory therapists with, within that environment. In addition, I think this is where our partnership with the Dell Medical School um, is really critical. Um, I can tell you that, that um, Dr. Elizabeth Matsui specializes on uh, asthma, childhood asthma, disparities and childhood asthma. Um, and they are, there is a pulmonologist who is being added to the Dell Med School team. And that is her concentration and she's getting here in August. Um, and, um, and the plan is really um, to integrate again and to create um, uh, access for our patient population specifically to care for um, those initiatives. In addition, um, there is um, long COVID, and right? everybody is, um, I think we're still trying to understand what long COVID is. And in our agreement that is being inked and going back and forth between attorneys um, is, uh, is working with the Dell Med School to care for individuals who have long COVID and respiratory ailments sit within that environment as well. Um, dental. Um, as far as dental, um, we are continuing to expand dental. Um, that is one of the significant areas of need, which means that we are meeting less than 50% of community need. And so um, that is a part of every one of our strategic um, plans. CUC is also increasing, uh, community care is also increasing their pediatric access to dental. And, um, and so we're working in that direction right now. Absolutely. Great question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I wanted to pick up on what Dr. Shalsha mentioned regarding COVID. One of the reasons that we did ask people to mask today is that COVID is increasing or surging in our community. And so we would ask you to help us, whether you're watching via Facebook Live or you're here in the room, to get the word out that vaccines are the most important thing we can do to protect ourselves and our community. As Dr. Shalsha mentioned soon, uh, people, children six months and older, um, everybody will have access to a vaccine, so it's really important that we continue to promote that because there are areas in our community that have significant gaps where um, it lags behind. So we're helping, we're happy to provide you with information. Um, there's uh, there are easy ways to find a vaccine near you. The easiest is vaccines.gov. Um, but anyway, we would really appreciate if you would help us get that message out because that's a critical piece uh, to helping stop this this surge that we're seeing now. Does anybody else in the audience have questions? Doctor? And would other people like to join me up here again? <laughs> Here's another doctor. <laughs> Hello, Jack Pierce. Um, I wanted to ask why you selected Zaragoza as a specialty clinic site. Uh, is that really accessible to everyone that really needs to get access, and are there going to be additional sites? That's my first question, so I'll let you answer that one. Okay. 
Um, great question. Um, Rosewood Zaragoza is an available site that we have, we can react to quickly. Um, it is off of I-35 where Monica spoke to the, you know, the, the density of the patient population who has access to that. It is, you know, if individuals need to access RZ, you know, once a week, it does become challenging because obviously traveling up and down the I-35 corridor is, you know, is challenging. Um, that said, uh, the hope is that um, for individuals who need specialty care, that is an episodic visit and not a weekly visit. In addition, there will be telehealth and other methods um, to access that, that clinic. And that, that, that clinic has rich history, you know, within Central Alton, within the community. So if there was an opportunity to utilize that clinic and celebrate that history, um, we wanted to do so. Um, and to the second part of your question, this is step one. As many of you sure. know, Central Health purchased the Hancock Building, and that also sits within kind of that I-35 corridor. That's 200,000 square feet of available space um, to build out services. And so the RZ clinic is step one and a phase one, and Hancock, we look to supersize um, or add additional specialties as is needed. In addition, I think there, there will be some uh, steps in between that, whether they are contractual with partners to increase access to specialty, or whether there are opportunities actually to build up, you know, other clinics. And, and yeah. using the Dell Medical Center as well, I, I assume. So Somewhat. we are, we're, I mean, our hope is that with RZ, we partner with Dell. You know, we've, we've sat with Annie Young, um, I think it was last week or the week mm -hmm. before, we met at RZ. Um, with some of their neurologists, with a neurologist from there, with Dr. Deepak, who's a gastroenterologist, with Amy Young, with the lead of their clinical system. Um, because again, as I said earlier, when we couple you know, academia to clinical care, um, we end up in a, potentially end up in a really good spot. And, and one of my concerns, of course, is what has been brought up in some of the meetings before was what's going out, what's going to happen out on the I-30 uh, type uh, area where you've got a lot of people moving out into that area for Tesla, et cetera, and how are we going to transition to that area to take care of them too? Because going to Zaragoza is not going to be necessarily easy for them. But Jack, let me emphasize that what Dr. Schultz has laid out is a specialty and subspecialty care at Rosewood mm -hmm. Zaragoza. And so when you think about the day-to-day the -day healthcare needs of individuals, that's why we have clinic expansions. We got construction underway in Hornsby Bend and in Dell Valley in the southeast part of the county. And then, knock on wood, soon um, we'll be able to start the, the wheels moving on the Colony Park. We've already in the process of purchasing the land from the city. And uh, as we get through site development, uh, that's actually going to be a much larger facility in Colony Park. And so, and that's in addition to the, the presence that we currently have there, because a lot of patients get their care from either you know, North Central or you know, Southeast Health and Wellness Center, um, at other areas east of 35. So what we're doing is additive, the places okay, that so you we, see are today. Are we really talking about primary care there? Is what we're talking primary about. care, yes, but also integrated mental behavioral health care, okay. uh, pharmacy, dental. Okay. And so it's the, it's the full spectrum of primary and preventative care. And okay. one, of, one of the things that, I mean, by thinking about alternative methods of care, so telehealth, if individuals actually have access in their home on the Eastern Crescent, you know, we would love to utilize that. If they don't, utilizing the clinics that, are, you know, as a, a hub for access to services is another opportunity we have. So they may not have to travel all the time okay. to these. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. I want to introduce uh, Mike Eastland, who is able to join us. He's our president and CEO here at Central Health. We have a question from Facebook Live, and then we all come back to you. Um, but this person asked, how does the health equity plan um, address the difficulty in accessing care for residents who increasingly struggle to afford housing in Travis County? I think uh, I'll, I'll start off and then please chime in. You know, first, understand that access to care, a lot of times it's a transportation, it's a mobility challenge. And we currently have people today that work to get patients that are transportation challenged uh, to their healthcare appointments. And so that's something that we're gonna continue, continue to build upon um, as we move through this health equity plan. But when you, when you think about other access issues, there's a myriad of issues that, 
that cause that. And it's not just saying, oh, this is the modality. It's making sure that everything that needs to be wrapped around that care experience is there so that we remove those barriers to access. Now that's ultimately where we're headed. Now, as we're, I'll let Monica speak to this, um, we're about to engage on our operational planning, like getting down to brass tacks and concrete action that we can take to make that vision a reality. Monica. I would say one of the other ways that we work, in addition to, um, you know, when you look at, um, there was a study that was done in Oregon that looked at they had a partial Medicaid expansion. And one of the things by providing access to healthcare coverage through that partial Medicaid expansion, they did it with um, I think 25,000 families and then there was another group that was not part of the expansion. Having access to healthcare coverage, whether it's a program like the medical assistance program uh, through our uh, MAP, MAP basic program or Medicaid or some other uh, insurance um, coverage, the thing they found in that study is that the financial relief that it improved people's mental health, it took away all sorts of um, stressors for them because having that healthcare uh, available is part of the affordability picture. Um, you know, we also are working with uh, different um, providers of housing who work with um, both permanent supportive housing and then supportive housing, affordable housing, making sure that there is ready access to healthcare services uh, within those uh, communities that are being developed to directly address the housing part of it. So it's, you know, we, we don't provide the housing part of it, but we work very collaboratively with the entities who do provide housing to make sure that uh, at least the, the people who are uh, facing housing affordability problems also don't have healthcare affordability problems on top of that. And the, the only thing I would add is COVID taught us some, some valuable lessons. I think when COVID first hit in March or February, March, when it affected the healthcare system in February, March of 2020, I remember at Community Care, we went from you know 98% in-person to close to 100% remote care within about eight days. Mm -hmm. And so one of the advantages that Central Health has is as the, the provider and also the payer, we can really look at what makes sense um, as far as the methodology to care for our patients. Good point. So yeah. conducting care by way of um, you know remote uh, telehealth. telehealth by looking at the telephone, we conducted care when we were selling setting up our telehealth, so our video visits. We used the telephone for some of those cares and for some behavioral health. Um, uh, diagnoses, that still is a viable care methodology. And so we are looking at all of that and trying to do the best by way of our patients and cater to the, you know, their care. Thank you. I'm going to you. Um, the gentleman brought up a great point that um, I am seeing in the community is, um, I actually said that I was going to move to the community so I could talk about the community, and I did. So now I know that um, there's people in our community who can no longer afford to live in our community. So is there a plan for those who are in the system, who are living in the communities, and you kind of keep them kind of to, with, the, or with their maps, even if they have to move outside of Travis County? I moved outside of Dallas, but I still drive to Dallas for my neurologist. Mm -hmm. People, once they get connected to a physician or a caregiver, they want to stay connected, but people, I, even though that's around me, they can't afford to live in our neighborhood. Right. So they're moving further east. Right. Are you going to just drop them? Well, when you look at, at, the, at the statute about healthcare and hospital districts, Mia, we fund care for those that are residing in Travis County. And there's, there's a residence uh, requirement for that. However, our partners, and this is one of the benefits of having a partnership with an FQHC, um, they see people outside of Travis County today. There's a lot of patient growth actually coming out of uh, Bastrop County. Uh, if you compare that now to what it was five years ago. And so 
to the extent that there can still be that continuum of care, even if a person is no longer on MAP, that can still happen uh, with their doctors and their, their providers as just as they were when they were on MAP. Now that's, that's easier said than done because obviously there's transportation challenges that, that will need to be overcome and you still want to maintain and, and, and respect and honor the trust that's been built. And, and I'm not just saying all patient relationships are a given. We still have to work at it, but that's, that's my response. And I, but I know that there's still um, the larger issue out there that I'm kind of circling around on, which is at some point we do need to talk about a regional appro approach to health care. And that's coming. Anybody else have any questions in the audience? Yvonne, did you have a question? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. It was back to what uh, Dr. Shasha was talking to us about a little bit ago, and that is uh, because Central Health is a, a, a payer and a provider now, uh, we have an opportunity to continue offering telehealth. And can you expand uh, on that? Why is it that uh, that why did you state that? Is it uh, are other payers not offering um, that service or not able to offer that service? Um, I know that they did during the pandemic, but how has that evolved since the since the pandemic started? Great question. Then I'm going to provide information that's a little tangential as well. Um, so I think uh, payers, CMS, are still concerning what that means, kind of long term. Um, but telehealth is a funded service. I think when you look at telephonics, so actually using the telephone, I think that is where there, there are more questions. Um, what I think where the advantages lie and where Central Health is really catering to the patients and has been for a while is Central Health actually funds medical assistant visits. They fund nurse visits, right? They fund dietitian and pharmacy visits in our partners within community care. Um, and again, what that does is really increase access and help wrap patient care. So by being the payer and the provider, um, you know, whether it's a community health worker, um, whether it's putting care teams within the hospitals for those transitions that we talked about, like we really can build bridges where there are gaps in care. And so I think the methodology by which patients access care is one part, one part of that. And I think you know, the whole country is still debating what that means and what the level of service and what level of billing and all of that. Um, but um, but I was really speaking to the entire care continuum again. Great question. Thanks. So we are going to wrap up. I want to start by thanking everybody who joined us in person. And of course, everybody who's watching at home, we know your lives are busy. So for you to take an hour and a half out of, out of your day to come here and visit with us, how are you doing? Good to see you. Um, we are really, we really appreciate that. We know your time is valuable, so thank you so much. And we would invite you to stay involved. This is just the beginning of this journey. Uh, as Yvonne mentioned, we have another community conversation scheduled for next Thursday at the Southeast Health and Wellness Center at 11 o'clock. Um, that will be provided in English and Spanish. We will be providing lunch as well. And then we encourage you, if you are able, if you are connected, um, to visit to subscribe for updates and it's on the screen participate uh, dot centralhealth.net sorry it's far away from me uh, <laughs> slash HEP uh, and then just click subscribe we promise we won't spam you or overwhelm you with information but we will provide you with timely updates about the healthcare equity plan and other key initiatives here at Central Health I can offer our panelists a final thought or word anybody want to say anything Mike thank you for joining us I know you had two commitments this morning. Um, this will be available uh, on, on Facebook, so if you, if you have friends, uh, colleagues, anybody in your network who couldn't watch, uh, please invite them to do so. We can share a link. And any questions that we get uh, from here moving forward, we will also answer and share on Facebook. So yes. we want to continue this dialogue. It doesn't end today. Uh, it continues. Yes. Uh, Ted, first of all, you know, thank you for um, leading the, the session today. And, and thank you to those, y gracias, uh, that have joined us here today uh, at Central Health, but also on Facebook Live. When you think about health equity and everything that we need to do to fill the gaps in health care to overcome disproportionate impacts and disease disparities, we can't do this alone. And we're thankful for our partners like C2H that um, and others that we work with to be able to connect with the communities 
and thank you for coming out last week if you were there at, at Navarro. Uh, all of this feeds into what it is that we should be doing as a healthcare district to serve those who are under-resourced, who are lower income, and don't have any other means to pay for their health care and to be able to give them access to health care and ultimately get it to the point where they can live the absolute healthiest life possible. That's a vision, but there are many steps that we need to take, and we can't do this without these connection points right here. And I want to thank Dr. Bell, our board chair, uh, for his leadership and for being here today and everybody else that contributed to this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody. You get vaccinated. Stay safe and stay healthy. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.